And our third group of presenters are coming to us from Connecticut College. We have Suzuko Knott, Jessica McCulloch, Karen Gonzalez-Rice, and Anne-Marie Davis, who will be speaking to us uh, about uh, the intersections of teaching, learning, and digital technology with regard to their Technology Fellows Program. Shazam, there we go. <laughs> Hello, hi, I'm Anthony Gratchen from Connecticut College, and I'm here today with a, uh, with a big group of collaborators, and uh, we, we, we wanna talk about the Technology Fellows Program, which is in its sort of second cycle at Connecticut College and represents um, a pretty deep uh, and ongoing developing collaboration uh, across the college. Um, and so we're gonna introduce this. this this collaboration, and I'm going to introduce this, talk a little bit about what this is in terms of a structure, um, if there's any administrator types in the room, to encourage them to sort of think about this kind of structure, but also um, to talk with us uh, about some further ideas. Um, but then we want to also um, highlight a little bit about sort of how we're assessing ourselves, but also showcase some of the work that's coming from this as well, from our colleagues uh, and in their courses. Um, this program emerged as part of a big gen ed curricular revision, a multi-year um, getting, getting our hands dirty with just sort of rethinking gen ed altogether, which has been wonderful and awful at the same time. Um, but wonderful because it's awful. And so, uh, and so, and, and then just basically, you know, new cohorts of of colleagues who are just thinking more deeply about how to integrate digital technologies into the classroom. And so this program emerged from this, just this momentum that was building, this desire to leverage digital technology to deeper, more impactful teaching and learning in courses across the college, outside of class, so on and so forth. Um, and so these are sort of our main objectives, really. And, it, and it's, it's, the emphasis here, it's pedagogically driven. And so this, this presentation follows nicely from um, colleagues from St. Joseph earlier and builds on what Sean was just talking about. Um, it's, you know, it's pedagogically driven. We begin sort of with, you know, what are our curricular needs? What kinds of digital technologies can we bring to the table to enhance those curricular needs? Um, but also, how can we build capacity? And it's thought that over time, we won't even need this program anymore. Maybe we'll just be doing this, period. That's very optimistic, uh, and, uh, but uh, we're optimists, I guess. And so these these are sort of our broader our broader um, standards, you know, objectives, I should say. And the part of this is also sort of developing best practices: is what works, what doesn't work. Um, attending to a lot of what uh, uh, what uh, Joe was saying this morning is that you know we're not we're not aiming to throw technology at teaching, but really pick and choose and discriminate, test, explore. Um, and be sort of open to success, but also very much open to failure. Um, and to bring those failures, to provide a forum where we can comfortably bring failures um, to the table. This is a deeply, deeply collaborative project. Um, so this is a selfie we shot while driving from Connecticut. Uh, we weren't actually driving when we shot this, but um, so, um, this isn't all of us. This is just a, this is just a portion of us. And so we come from all different uh, departments and offices across the college, um, including uh, information services, a lot of instructional technologists, librarians, um, anthropologists, I mean, actually historians, art historians, behavioral neuroscience, theater, Hispanic studies, Japanese. Uh, we have a Germanist in the room. Uh, we, so, we, so, so it's, it's intentionally and deeply collaborative. And one of our goals is just sort of to um, intentionally sort of deconstruct this uh, idea that there are faculty and there are staff. Get, get beyond these sort of artificial divisions that I think inhibit collaborations, break those barriers down, and make um, uh, faculty, right, so now I'm going to invoke those labels, make faculty, and here I think it's really important, make faculty realize that, you know, this is not a going alone approach and that you shouldn't be sort of operating from within your little sort of, you know, your, your, your silo, uh, and that there's a lot of expertise out there, um, a lot of skills, um, a lot of, yeah, they're, they're trained, highly degree people who, who this is what they do and they do it really well. And so for all that reasons, I mean, we, we're, we're building this very big collaboration. The Technology Fellows Program, it exists outside of information services. It exists outside of our Center for Teaching and Learning. It's meant in many ways to actually bridge these, these sort of these two groups, both of 
broader organizations are, you know, are subscribed to the ideas that, you know, we're, we're very much interested in, in, in doing that, doing better teaching and in creating a better learning environment. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a, essentially it's a three semester program. We're in our second round of this. We ran our pilot program last year. There are five fellows from the faculty. They have to submit proposals um, and talk about sort of what they want to do, plans to do, what kind of curricular changes they want to integrate. Um, and it's uh, and it's intensive, and so the first with a lot of obligations that are spelled out um, in the first semester. You know, we're getting together and we're just sort of you know figuring out where where we stand. What is our what is our collective knowledge here, and with respect to sort of what are digital technologies? What is digital literacy? Um, challenging assumptions of digital natives among our students. Um, thinking about accessibility issues as we're thinking about how to integrate technologies into the classroom and into curricula. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a host, so we come together in a series of, of seminars um, over the course of the semester, and then there's their obligations. We, we hold those faculty fellows responsible for going to center on teaching and learning uh, seminars that focus on technology to participate in that. Um, we have a teaching with technology series uh, that's run out of information services. Um, they have to go to those workshops as well, and, and we want them to present when it makes sense. And then they also have to actively contribute to uh, a blog that that, um, uh, that our instructional technologists are, are running, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, we shift into a summer. We have a week-long Temple Summer Institute that's very oriented around basically um, teaching, learning, and um, exploring, excavating uh, digital technologies. We focus our faculty fellows before we go into that so that they can sort of make the most of this week-long intensive experience and really push forward to developing the thing that they want to develop in, in their particular course. In the fall, we come back for our second semester, lots more attendant obligations. We work these people hard. Uh, <laughs> so lots of seminars and, uh, and more blogging of the sort. And then the third semester, it, we originally sort of thought this might be sort of the implementation of these ideas. What we found in our pilot program is that actually the implementation begins in that second semester anyway. We're very enthusiastic. We just can't hold back. And we also found that it's not really just one course, but we find that these ideas begin to sort of, they become applicable across individual curricula. And so you go, I, you try something out in one course, and you go, this sort of, this was cool, but actually this would work a lot better in this other course that I've had. And it begins to just sort of virally spread across in a good way. Um, and then and then in that third semester, it actually overlaps with the incoming cohort. So there's meant to be some mentoring here, some opportunities for uh, new fellows to learn from old fellows, successes and failures, and so on and so forth. Um, you have to support this. You need, so, so you need infrastructure. Our budget is modest by uh, most standards, but nevertheless, um, this is a lot of time. And so every faculty fellow is given a course remission. So one course pulled off of their teaching load for that academic year. There's a modest stipend. Um, we have a program budget for coming to conferences, for talking to people, books, shared books, um, equipment when relevant. But outreach is a big part of this as well. And so to build capacity, we have to sort of create a culture of encouragement. Um, most of our fellow participants are pre-tenure. We want a culture in which those pre-tenured colleagues do not feel like it's going to harm them in going up for the tenure process because they are innovators, they are experimenters, because we know there are going to be some things that don't work, and this might impact course evaluations. We're going to think deeply about that before going in. We're going to really sort of get down into the nitty-gritty of the weeds of curricular design before going in so that we can make the best possible outcomes, but we can't punish innovation and experimentation. And so part of that is creating a culture across the the college, uh, across the Committee on Appointments, Promotion, and Tenure among the administrators and departmental chairs when thinking about basically what their colleagues are doing. Um, and this is a plug for the Connecticut College Engage blog, which is part of the sort of the obligations. So all fellows are, are meant to, um, are asked to contribute to this a couple times in the semester, but it's a part of dissemination as well. So there are only five fellows. We have a lot more. We have like another 170 faculty colleagues teaching classes actively, um, and then folks working in other offices who aren't teaching classes, and we want to share the ideas, the wisdom. Sometimes they're just little tidbits, how to do something better so you can shave off some time during the day. Other times they're like, this is what happened in this class, and it was awful, and let me talk about it here and tell you why. Uh, and so this is our, our Engage blog. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over now to my colleague Jessica, who's going to talk a little bit about assessment. Developing some kind of program assessment for something that includes 
five different faculty members with wildly different pedagogical philosophies and teaching styles and content that they want to teach um, is really challenging. So we have some a lot of existing tools that we can utilize, so um, student assignments to assess student learning um, or attempt to assess student learning. Um, course evaluations, right, that we use across the campus anyway. So there are things we can utilize that exist. Um, but there is a small gap um, in some of the things that we're trying to accomplish in this program and what kind of information we can get from these different types of assessments. And so we created um, just a very short pre and post survey. Um, we did this in Moodle. So the faculty who are the fellows can deploy it in their Moodle courses and require their students to take um, the survey. And some of the questions we ask, it really just sort of gauges student um, attitudes and um, experiences with technology. So here's one of the questions um, that we ask in the post-survey. And it's really asking about um, their, how they um, felt about the use of technology in their courses. And you can see that overwhelmingly the students thought that they were comfortable using the technologies. They thought the technology skills they learned were transferable to other courses. Um, that's really important to me anyway. Um, they also found that over 70% of the students found that the technologies enhanced their learning in the course. So that to us um, is a really, really good news. So we are on the right track. Um, another piece of information I thought might be interesting to see is that in the pretest, um, on the left-hand side, you'll see that we asked students if they felt like they were technology savvy, average users of technology, or technology challenged. Um, and 9% of the students identified the technology challenge. And you can see that over the course of a semester, right, they sort of, we had fewer students, right, self-identifying as technology challenged. Um, so that's an incremental change, but if you can imagine over a series of you know, four years and technology is integrated into courses little by little, by the time they graduate, they should have some pretty good technology skills and feel really comfortable with using a lot of different types of technology without ever really having to teach them technology. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to Suzuko. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit from the faculty perspective and sort of some of the implementation um, of these projects. And then you'll also hear from another colleague of mine, Anne-Marie, and her experiences in her classroom. So, um, Let's see, wrong way. <laughs> uh, so I taught a first year seminar this past fall semester. Uh, and again, in the context of the sort of GE revision that's going on, and um, I decided to implement two different types of digital, um, digital media assignments. And um, this was also, this FYS was also part of a pilot program for the GE, so there was kind of a lot going on in this class. Um, but like most first year seminars, it's meant to introduce the students to sort of the college, college life, but the culture of the college, as well as this place, New London, Connecticut. Um, and uh, so the first assignment was to kind of get them out into a place on campus, our Arboretum, where they were doing digital images and then using those digital images to sort of talk about, or like to create a, a narrative, a, a short travel narrative in the context of, of the course content. Um, and then the second digital media assignment was a short film which they shot uh, on location. I took them on a field trip to the Mashantucket Pequot um, Museum and the Foxwoods Casino, which is also on the Mashantucket um, Pequot Reservation um, nearby. So um, this is just a list of some of the technologies and resources that I was tapping into as I was um, developing and implementing this project. Um, my students received iPods from something called Delhi, that's our digi digital, uh, digitally enhanced learning initiative, and the college uh, provides hardware for students. You have to apply um, and work because I can't assume that students have this technology. Um, and then uh, we, these are the, the sort of um, software that I use. Um, we all, uh, not all of us on the campus, but uh, we can use Moodle as our, our course platform, which I do. So they are sort of using that as their kind of go-to for course management stuff, uh, doing forums and, and uh, threads and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, I also, thinking about the assignment and wanting to prime them, um, had two different workshops that I developed. Um, uh, together with my colleagues. So I had a, a colleague of mine in film studies who does um, uh, film production come in and talk to my students about filming uh, and the ethics of filming in public spaces and how to hold their iPod correctly so that they don't get the like black box effect, right? 
Um, and then I also had um, our uh, instructional design librarian, Jessica McCullough, and then also um, the instructional designer and IT liaison, uh, Laura Little, come in uh, after the students had gone on the field trip and had gotten their footage to do a uh, hands-on iMovie workshop with them where they were actually editing um, their material. Um, so I had obviously specific learning goals. I wanted them uh, to have the freedom to create, uh, but to also um, create and, and, uh, and engage in critical expression in something other than the written form, right? Um, we were looking at um, travel narratives in many different media, right? We were reading things, but we were also um, watching films and looking at art um, and like visual art. And I wanted them to have uh, one experience where they are actually having to sort of engage in the same practices and think about what does it mean to go out into the world, get the source material footage, right? And then create um, a narrative out of it that, that, that says something. Um, and I also wanted them to have this project-based learning experience and then also to get some um, hands-on experience with these tools. Um, there are challenges to these kinds of projects, obviously. Um, the asterisk here uh, denotes things that I expected, right? So these are the things that I really expected. I expected, for example, that this is going to take a lot of time. And I planned for that, right? I had class time that was devoted to these workshops. I had class time that was devoted to going away to a site. Um, and I also uh, was anticipating this myth of the digital native, right, that, that my students, right, I can't assume that they all know how to use these things. I can't assume that they've all made films before. Um, but what was a little bit unexpected was that they themselves assume that they are digital natives. And so there were a whole host of problems that came up that I didn't expect that had to do with organi organizational issues using things like Google Drive, um, which um, you know they, they have access to, and we gave them lots and lots of instruction on that. But for some reason, as soon as I asked them to go away from the platform they were most experienced with, Moodle, um, and had them putting content in other places, it was like Pandora's box opened, and I was like hunting and pecking and looking for, for their assignment. Um, it took more time, even more time. Even though I was planning for time, it took more time. And then um, I had to make think about like questions. So this is just an example, right? Moodle turned out to be a terrible place to put digital images. Um, everything was sort of cattywampus, and so I had to abandon that. For the film, right, that's an even larger file. That's more images. It's really, really tricky. Um, and so I had to think about how to do that. So we abandoned Moodle and went to Google Drive instead. Obviously, I wanted to scaffold my stuff, so um, I have my um, assignment scaffolded. But this is sort of what happened, right? This is a, just a screenshot of the organizational crazy um, that happened. Um, I was just getting random files with no tags on them, <laughs> even though they had, right? This is how you share in Google Drive, right? an instructional video. And uh, this is how you fill them, and this is how you do all of that. Um, so good project, bad project, how to assess that, but it was really tricky. Um, I had a rubric. I had to kind of rethink my rubric. I had to decide that process is where the grading and evaluation needs to happen, not necessarily in the final product, um, and less is always more. I was going to show a clip, but I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, and um, we can uh, move on. Hi, I'm Amory Davis, and I'm in the history department. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about two course projects. Like Anthony was saying, um, I started out thinking I was only, only going to do one, but I ended up getting really excited and did a pilot project um, um, to try to prepare myself for the second project. Um, so this was a great opportunity. Let's see here. OK, so both of the projects I did in collaboration. Oh, and by the way, I'm in the history department. Um, <laughs> but I also teach cross-listed courses. My um, expertise is Japanese history. And I teach cross-listed courses in, in East Asian studies. So there's um, a lot to be spoken for for area studies in these projects. So um, like I was about to say, these, uh, both of my projects um, I did in collaboration with the Connecticut College Lindelier Center for Special Collections and Archives. And as a result of the projects, there were two permanent student-curated professional online archival exhibits that people can visit now. Um, they're meant to be professional again, and um, we're seeing that a global audience is coming to visit these and get information, um, researchers and just people who are interested in the collections at Connecticut College. Um, for both of these projects, in the fall semester and in the spring semester, I spent about 
three to four weeks. I carved out these weeks, took away things that I normally did in my regular curriculum, and made time to try to promote these projects with the students. Okay, so this is a picture of a web portal that um, Linda, the Lindelier Center developed for me and for um, these exhibits that I created this year with my students um, and future exhibits, hopefully. Um, so you can see there's a link at the top to the first exhibit. Um, it's entitled Journal of a Voyage from New York to Hong Kong, uh, written by a man named Cornelius Gold, who happens to be from Connecticut in the 1860s. And again, this is part of a larger collection of papers, journals, letters that Cornelius Gold wrote around the time of the Civil War. Um, he happened to be a man that wanted to join the military, but because he was deemed um, not healthy enough, he did something that was quite um, common back then. He hopped on a ship and decided to travel around the world. And my students and I um, basically engaged in a project in which we transcribed and then um, did research and annotated his journal. And we put this all up um, on the exhibit. Um, this was last spring semester, and it was done with a 200 level class. And then the bottom exhibit um, is uh, another exhibit that was done with first year students um, in a first year seminar. The topic of the seminar was representations and stereotypes, historical cultural representations of the East and the West. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the preparations and executing these things and also comparing the results just a little bit. I, I see I have like a minute left, so I'll try to rush through. Oh, I was also going to talk about my goals, but um, I think this is, you know, this is a little blurb from the history department. I think a lot of these goals are very common and they don't need speaking to, and they actually resonate with all of us, whether we're teaching in history, English, um, especially the humanities, social sciences, and um, maybe a little, little bit even from a STEM perspective. Um, but also in combination <laughs> um, with the history department goals, I kind of integrate my own personal philosophy. I feel like we have this type of millennial predicament with our students. Um, and the predicament I see is that we're inundated. Um, students are just kind of swimming, all of us, not just uh, the students, but um, faculty researchers nowadays with the advent um, of the torrent of data thrown off by the world, internet, connected computers, tablets, and smartphones. All of us are just swimming in data. And that's a new problem that students and researchers didn't have to face about 10 years ago. So how do we figure this out? Um, so my response to this is to, um, rather than um, emphasize being a professor in disseminating information in the classroom, now I'd like to use um, digital technology to create virtual labs in which I can get my hands um, dirty with my students, give them experience of what it's like to be a historian, and produce, learn how to produce and reproduce information and new knowledge responsibly, um, not just for them in a meaningful way, in an authentic way, um, but also in a way that might have some relevance for global um, readership, global consumption. So, and I have this image here because this was the copy of the, the cover of the Economist just this past week, so I thought it spoke to what I was trying to talk about today. Um, so, let's see, whoa. Okay, so I was just going to mention that in planning and executing this, it was um, a, quite a big, complicated undertaking. This had its pros and cons. Uh, it was the largest collaboration I've ever been involved in. Um, as trained as a historian, I usually work by myself. I'm quite independent. Um, but in order to do these things, I had to work very closely. Um, basically, I have pictures of all the people, um, all the faculty and um, staff that shared files. Um, had two people from the Lindelier Center, instructional technologist, the reference librarian. And um, in creating these projects, I kind of looked at the Lindelier Center not only as our consultant and telling us what kind of product they wanted the students to create because it would be on their website, um, but also seeing them as a type of um, client um, that we had to please. Um, and in doing that, you know, it was quite, there were a lot of hands in the pot, and it was quite a co complicated project. And often they were off, uh, teaching me about new technologies that they wanted to have used for um, their virtual exhibitions. And so I found myself in situations where I was often taking crash, crash courses on these technologies to figure out how to use them, how to bring them into the classroom, how to teach them, and de design um, very explicit assignments for the students. So this um, was a good thing and a bad thing. I think we talked a lot yesterday about um, showing modeling for the students, what it's like to 
kind of um, learn with them. Um, but again, it's very daunting. Um, but let's see how it resulted. Let's see some of the um, responses. I took some surveys at the end of both classes, and uh, very interesting. And in addition to um, the students' responses in the surveys, I also got some of the responses that I'll show you in a second um, from some reaction papers that the students did. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. So here's, here's the good stuff. A um, lot of positives across the board from both classes. Students were commenting that they felt that this allowed them to improve their research. Um, they were really super excited across the board again um, that they had created something that, you know, like I said, was meaningful, permanent, something that was professional that people around the world could appreciate. Um, and then a lot of them commented on the fact that they thought it was an interesting original assignment and they enjoyed that. Um, what was interesting was that we had spent a lot of time wondering, you know, are these assignments appropriate for first year students or more appropriate for, you know, say fourth year students? And, um, going into the projects, we thought, oh, probably for fourth-year students, but what we found was that the first-year students um, engaged with this in a much more open and flexible way and um, kind of came to the courses with a lot less, a uh, lot fewer expectations. Um, and so they were a little bit more responsive. The 200-level students, um, they were quite polarized. I had some students who actually enjoy the project so much that now they want to do independent studies. Um, and then some other students made comments like, I don't know why we were studying HTML. This was one class for five minutes, but <laughs> I don't know if this was appropriate. So it was interesting to find that already with 200 level, uh, 200 level students, um, we, we have some expectations as to what is appropriate in the classroom. Do you think we could maybe, yeah. um, I think we need to just a couple minutes for questions. Okay. Maybe we could stay yeah. after and talk. And I think we're going to upload all the pre pre presentation slides to some general place, and we'll let you know about that. Okay. Well, this is my last slide, okay. and I was just going to share it with you. Um, you guys can read it while you're doing your Q&As, but I just thought it was really interesting, not because the student appreciated the project, because, but because they had a metacognitive approach to the whole experience as liberal arts students and this kind of um, flipped learning that they experienced um, through the project. So hopefully you get a chance to read it. Thank you.